Hi, everyone. I am uh, Julia Campbell. I'm the Director of Programs at Arch Grants. So excited that you all could join us today. I am thrilled to be joined by Andrew Glantz, the CEO, founder of gift a meal So gift a meal was a 2018 awardee um, and an all-star in that cohort. Um, so if you're not familiar with gift a meal they're a mobile app that helps provide a meal to someone in need locally. Um, each time a customer takes a photo um, with a partner restaurant on their app. So um, Andrew is going to tell his story about how he started Gift Meal. Um, we have been very lucky to have him be part of the, of the Arch Grants family. And, um, and so uh, just a quick note about Arch Grants. We, held a, we um, had our application window um, open in April. It is now closed and we are starting to uh, process those applications. So big thanks to all those who, um, who might have submitted an application. If you have any questions about Arch Grants um, or like for more, more information, I'll put my contact information in chat. Happy to answer those questions. And without any further ado, I will hand it over to Andrew Glantz. Awesome. Thanks, Julia. And here I will start sharing my screen as well. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Julia, good. Awesome. Um, cool. Uh, well, hey, everybody. As Julia mentioned, uh, my name is Andrew Glantz, and I'm the founder and CEO of Gift a Meal. I founded Gift a Meal back when I was a student at WashU uh, and then stuck around to work on this post grad. Uh, and so I'm going to talk to you today about how to build a social venture. So, first, I'm going to go over just kind of my background, how I built Gift a Meal and give you like a little bit of a preview of what our investor pitch looks like um, if you're looking at kind of paralleling some of our slides in your business uh, and also just give you a good background for things that I might be able to answer questions about or be able to give tips on. Uh, then I'll talk about how to integrate social responsibility into a business um, and can also answer your questions related to your specific social ventures uh, and then just some kind of miscellaneous marketing tips that I've picked up along the way. Uh, to try to make things as actionable and implementable as possible. So starting off with my journey, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles, California. And when I was in high school, I uh, became vice president of a children's charity called Junior Variety uh, that was helping children across a wide array of issues um, such as mobility, hunger, and education. And so I always had at my core a uh, desire to be giving back to the community, uh, but I didn't always know what form that would take. And um, I didn't think that I was going to be an entrepreneur or start a social venture. Uh, so when I went to Wash U, I was undecided, switched majors eight times as I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do in life. And I had an unpaid internship at a venture capital firm one summer called Malvatos Capital. And it was there that I was exposed to the idea of a profits with a purpose company and the concept of doing well while doing good. And when I was on a lunch break, uh, with the other intern, we were talking about how people discover restaurants and how people are also, you know, promoting restaurants or sharing food photos or uh, sharing things of social responsibility like the LS Ice Bucket Challenge and had the idea of what if posting and donating could be one of the same. So when somebody shares out a food photo, they could also be helping those in need. So I came up with the original idea as a mix of marketing and giving back for restaurants and a way for, to promote, that, promote them while also giving back. And so I launched it with my savings and kind of, you know, went up and down, up and down to pitch competitions, et cetera. Uh, and then we were selected to participate in Capital Innovators Spring 2016 cohort and received a 50K investment from them. And that was my junior year at WashU. Uh, almost dropped out, stayed in school. And then uh, once I graduated, we then got I-10 Mock Angel certified. Um, so another great program in St. Louis. And that helped us prepare for our angel round of funding and raise 165K in October 2018. And then those investors were very happy because the following month, we were then announced as an Arch Grant recipient. Um, and so then uh, with the combination of the cash from the funding round along uh, with uh, Arch Grants, we were able to actually build a team. Uh, and so it wasn't just me anymore. I was able to bring a CTO onto the team, a head of sales, um, a number of other individuals to really look to build this out uh, as well. So diving into what Gift a Meal is, uh, let's first focus on the hunger problem. So right now, uh, I actually had to update this slide, unfortunately, because the numbers have risen over this course of the last six months, especially during the pandemic, 
where the number of people facing daily food insecurity, meaning uh, people that don't know where they're going to find their next meals, is on the rise. Uh, so currently in even just the St. Louis metro area, one in four children face daily food insecurity. And so this is a really, really big problem. A lot of people uh, don't know the full extent of it. It could be somebody that has a job or doesn't have a job or has a house or is homeless. It's a wide array of individuals and a lot of the people affected are children. And so Gift and Meals looking to solve this problem while also helping support local restaurants. So we do this through our easy to use mobile app for iPhone or Android. And all the user needs to do is take a photo of their meal, uh, whether it's a dining or takeout from one of our partner restaurants to give a meal to someone in need. And then they're given the option to share their photo on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter to give a second, third, or fourth meal as well. And so this is all funded by the restaurants paying us a monthly subscription as a mix of marketing and giving back. So it's free for the users. This is where the money comes from. And we're a for-profit social venture. So again, we're marketing for the restaurant, like cost marketing. And we're donating on an average month about 20 to 25% of this monthly subscription to support local food banks. And so at the end of every month, we tally up how many meals we should donate based off of the number of photos taken. And each food bank has a meal me metric, which is their cost to distribute uh, to distribute 1.2 pounds of healthy food that's donated from supermarkets to hundreds of neighborhood pantries where those in need could access it. And depending on how big and bulk the food bank distributes, it's typically between 10 to 25 cents per meal. So that's how the business model works. And so now we've built this out to about 250 partner restaurants. Most recently, we launched the 32 location Lions Choice. Uh, and that also brought us into the Kansas City market as well. So now we're in St. Louis, Kansas City, Chicago, Detroit. And we work with a mix of chain restaurants, franchisees, independent restaurants, restaurant groups, and more. And so far, we've been able to provide over 600,000 meals to those in need. And so that's something we're really proud of as a for-profit company to make that level of impact. But it's not just a social impact, there's a business impact as well. Uh, and so when we've been able to do case studies with some of our partner restaurants like Espresso Yourself, we've been able to measure that when customers are using gift to meal on average, they're spending more per check, returning more frequently and tipping more than a typical customer at Espresso Yourself. So the way we did this is they gave us access to their point of sale data and we were able to match the names on credit card transactions to the names of the gift to meal user accounts so that we could segment the customers that used gift to meal ones that did it and then compare the two groups. So this was a really great way to validate a lot, a lot of our initial assumptions with that we'd seen in research about socially, the socially conscious incentive driving people to take action and support local businesses as opposed to just a financial incentive like a Groupon that cuts into a restaurant's margins and might just get a one-time customer rather than really create that return customer. So currently we have six of us on this team. So still, you know, we're pretty tight knit. Um, me, uh, Brian, myself, and George are full-time. Emily, Doug, uh, and Danny are part-time right now. And uh, Emily and Danny joined the team uh, over the course of the last couple of months. The way we got all these restaurants on board was through a mix of, you know, just cold calling the restaurant, reaching out on Instagram direct message to get directly to the owner or social media manager. We formed some cool partnerships, like one with the food distributor Cisco, where their sales reps are walking us in the door to introduce us to their client restaurants. Um, so Cisco is a food distributor that, just, that restaurants buy, you know, chicken and ketchup and all different types of food from. And so they already have relationships and we offer their uh, clients a 10% discount to join gift to meal and we also get uh, restaurants through referrals and we're starting to do more on the inbound side. Uh, and so that's something we're excited about where we're now uh, looking to run Facebook and Instagram ads targeted at restaurant owners to get them to reach out to us and then close the deal over a virtual sale rather than doing something in person that might take a lot of time to drive out to meet the restaurant and then they might be busy and have to cancel and just takes up a lot, a lot of time um, in terms of scaling. And then we're looking to continue these types of partnerships that we've started to develop with places like Cisco with other spots as well. So we're looking at a partnership with the Missouri Restaurant Association that we're launching next month. Uh, and then we also are looking at working with more chains similar to Lion's Choice. So I know I just rambled on about Gift and Meal for a long amount of time. Um, so now I'm going to go more uh, into general, but to still tie in the experience into how you can integrate social responsibility into your business. So I mentioned some of the case studies that we did with Gift a Meal, 
where we were able to see this type of increased spend visits and tip size. Uh, and this is some, this really validated a lot of the research that we saw in the field. For instance, in the 2020 Consumer Culture Report, especially for millennials, they found that millennials were more likely to spend more at a business if it supported a cause. It, they also boosted their brand uh, awareness and it also boosted the loyalty for the millennial to the brand. And so if you're deciding at the very beginning whether you want to be starting a social venture, having social responsibility be an aspect of your business, then it could have a lot of really great financial implications for your business as well. And another big aspect of it is that you can really attract great talent um, into your company when employees feel really satisfied, not just that they're helping you make money um, to develop widgets, but that they're doing something that's positive for the community as well. Um, so especially in a startup, where your tools are limited to cash, equity, and fun, um, this is really um, another really great tool to attract top talent into your team. And people might be willing to take a little bit of a discount at the early stages as well, if it's helping you there too. And also for investors as well. And this is really important, especially in the pandemic, to have social responsibility in a business because this has become even more important for consumers when they're making decisions. Um, so this was a study done by the Journal of Business Research um, that looked at it over, it, this was over a really large sample size when they were looking at how customers had had shifts in their consumption behavior. And they found it in their, they concluded in their study that this is a, a change that's likely to continue going forward. So having social responsibility as a part of the business is something really important. Now, that doesn't mean that you're, you need to force your startup to be a social venture in order to have social responsibility in a business. It doesn't have to be a buy one, give one model. Um, you can just have different aspects of ways that you're doing things sustainably or, or treating employees in the right way or doing something to give back to the community that could kind of check these boxes as well. But the more and more you're being authentic with it and having it integrate into the business, the better results you'll see. And one of the big reasons because of this, uh, that this is true, is that there's a lack of social, corporate social responsibility awareness. A lot of people uh, have expressed that they'd be willing to, to support a business more that's giving back, but fewer people actually know of the brands that are supporting these good causes. And so a lot of the times there's kind of just one big press release of a brand doing something positive for the community, and then people forget about it. So if it's something that's baked into the core of your brand and something that's engaging people, then that can have a lot better results. So in order to get that customer buy-in, you have to really make sure that the, your aspect of social responsibility is really understandable and something that's short and something that they can recall later on. So not something that you know is a 10 page corporate social responsibility report that no one's gonna remember, something that's really easy and catchy. And then another aspect is that it's easy for the customer to become involved in the program as well. So for us, the customer can just get involved by taking a photo to give a meal and that's their way of take, putting in enough effort that they're aware of it, but it's not something that it's a barrier to them becoming involved. Like it's not like they have to go through a ton of different steps. They just need to take a photo to get involved. And by the act of doing that, you know, they spent enough time on it that they internalize that that restaurant's doing something for the community. Lastly, or second to lastly, is that it's impactful. So something that the customers really feel like is making a difference in the community um, in, in order to have them get behind it pretty straightforward. And then you want it to be shareable. Um, and the shareability of your social responsibility is important because it really extends the trust in the brand if customers are sharing out your social responsibility rather than just you kind of pushing it out there. Um, there was a study done by the Spanish Journal of Marketing that was looking at hotels that were tweeting out themselves about their social responsibility versus their customers doing it. And they looked at the impact that those tweets had on customer trust of their social responsibility. And as one might expect, the tweets made by the customers were a lot more impactful on boosting the customer trust and their awareness of the brand than it was by the hotel brand itself. So getting the customers to share out for you is something that really can reinforce that. Um, especially as a for-profit social venture, this type of positive publicity and reinforcement of the, your do-good efforts by others is important because you never want somebody to think, oh, you're a for-profit company, that's a bad thing. 
why are you keeping 75 to 80% of the profits? Why aren't you a nonprofit? You want them to be comparing you to other for-profit companies that might be giving 1% of their, uh, their proceeds to support a cause or even less than that and be like, wow, for a for-profit company, you're doing something really great in the community and there's no inherent problem with making money um, and you're showing that you can do well while doing good and you're making profits with a purpose. In terms of measuring your return on investment of social responsibility, whether for if it's for your brand or for your customer, there's a few different ways that you can look to do this. First is through doing different surveys. So you can look at measuring the net promoter score, looking at the number of your customers that are promoting your business um, and then subtracting out the people that are detractors that uh, are actively against your business and don't like you. Uh, in order to measure that over time to see how that opinion is changing as you continue to adopt different social responsibility practices. You can also look at before and after behavior for customers. So for instance, in our case, looking at uh, the customers before they used gift meal at the restaurant and then comparing their behavior afterwards. So you're controlling for that same customer and it's just the difference is about their, whether they had knowledge of the social responsibility program and seeing if there was a change afterwards. So these are just a few different ways and there's a lot of different ways you can use surveys and it's something that's really free and easy to do just through a Google form. So really accessible for everybody. Another way you could look to measure this is through things like social media mentions. If you're doing things through a hashtag campaign, and seeing how often that is occurring or in terms of tagging something, or if you are tying it to a specific product, um, then you can measure to see how often that somebody is coming through a specific link to your website through different social media posts or things like that. Um, and then also you get a lot of free PR and media publicity as a social venture. Uh, and so that's something that can really help your business, not just to get more eyeballs, but again, to get more credibility. And then you can use those media articles to then, you know, send us follow-ups to potential prospects that are clients of yours uh, in order to help close deals and also boost trust for our investors on pitch competitions and things like that. So especially even at the very early stages, if you're doing a social venture, then you can reach out to you know, the St. Louis Business Journal, the Post-Dispatch and all these different media sources. And they definitely would like to cover that, especially at your early stages of launching. And that can get you a lot of early stage validation before you have real traction. Uh, next is in terms of data. Um, so in terms, if you can actually, this is the best form. If you can just measure increased engagement for things, then that's great. Like if you're running ads and one doesn't have social responsibility in it and one does, and then you could actually measure to see if the cost per click is lower. Um, or if you do things like syncing up the purchasing data, like we've done with our case studies, so we can actually measure that change in behavior. Uh, or if you're having like a specific link that you, it's a trackable link, that's coming through some type of social responsibility channel with that type of messaging. So you know if a customer ordered through your site or something like that due to the social responsibility advertising. So in terms of just kind of the high level, what makes a successful corporate social responsibility, first is being authentic. As a social venture, you have a really high bar that you set for yourself uh, and the community holds you to it. So you can't slip up. You have to be authentic and genuine. And if somebody sniffs out that you might not be genuine or they think you're scammy, then that can ruin your entire brand. So making sure that you're authentic in all of your practices and messaging with social responsibility is really important. Uh, next is making sure that it's a branding fit. In order to have the best financial implications for your business and have it really connect, it needs to be something that people can identify with your brand and really be something that um, you know, that's easy for them to uh, think about when they talk about your brand. So for instance, there's, if we were like, okay, for every photo taken on gift a meal, we're going to be um, donating to an orphanage in Australia. Um, that's, a, for, there might be a great cause in order to support children in Australia at that orphanage, but um, it's nothing that's really connected to our brands or to uh, the experience of you know, dining at that restaurant in St. Louis. And so making sure it's a branding fit is something that's really important too. Uh, and lastly is being consistent. So this is across all of your messaging, whether it's to investors or to uh, in sales or in user-facing marketing or in media or on your website, making sure you're consistent and that you're not telling a bunch of different people different stories is something that I found to be really, really important 
And along with that consistency is having that type of transparency. So that way people aren't catching you saying two different things to two different people. And so what I try to do is whenever I do media interviews, I always make sure to bring up to get to meals a for-profit company as quickly as possible. And that, you know, we're looking to help support restaurants while giving back so that way we can address these potential questions people would have at the onset rather than them just thinking, oh, we're just a do-good organization that's feeding people in need. Um, they, we want to make sure people understand that we're doing something to support these restaurants as a cause marketing platform so people don't get confused later on and hold it against us. In terms of some marketing tips, um, so these are just kind of some kind of quick slides that I put together um, of some quick tips that I've learned. So in terms of product side of things. So uh, one thing I've learned is that there could be a lot of upfront costs, especially like with things like building an app. And so I definitely would recommend to other people looking to like build an app out there. Don't build an app right away. It's expensive. It costs us $15,500 to build the first iOS app. And now it's just my savings. And then uh, the initial version of the app, I built a bunch of different features into that people didn't even want. And I had to pay more development dollars to undo that development. And uh, we ended up scrapping that whole app um, later on anyways, and hired a person to bring the app in-house. So um, instead, I'd suggest building a minimum viable product, doing something like if you were doing like an app or software type of thing, do it through a mobile website instead of an app, um, or through things like Google Sheets, um, using a service called uh, Zapier.com. Uh, uh, you can connect different types of documents and things and across different software, and you could really build a lot of functionality out that way, where you could continually just build something that's not very expensive, and then measure it and learn and continually iterate um, on as you continue to build up your ideas. And so rather than uh, just kind of starting and building out exactly uh, what you see as your final vision, um, you would start by getting something that's functional, but maybe, you know, not the full functionality that you'd want down the road, and then continually building out more and more functionality and seeing what the response is like. And as you do all these things, as you build up enough of a sample size, you can conduct some A-B testing where you randomly uh, select uh, your visitors or prospects to go into two different groups where you can show them different pricing or you can show them uh, different versions of the product and see what your conversion rate is on your sales pitch or things like that with people actually uh, buying your products. So that way you can figure out which way to go. So it's more informed data. Another aspect of, of things to keep in mind is that people's time is money. It's very, you know, like people have valuable things to do with their time. One of the things that I thought about initially with Gift a Meal is uh, when I was offering it for free to restaurants to build up our user base at the very beginning, I was like, oh, if it's something that's free for them, then of course they're going to join um, because, you know, at the worst case, it's going to do nothing. And the best case, you know, it's going to get them a little bit more business. But what I didn't think through is just like the cost of their like mental energy because they have so many other things to think about. Uh, is something that is really, really um, important to consider. So um, when you're weighing out the cost benefit analysis of, in the mind of your customer, take into account their time for that sales pitch too. And then something else is in terms of delayed gratification versus instant gratification uh, and making sure that the incentive structures align to provide instant gratification for your customers as well. I remember with one of the initial features I had with Gift a Meal, we had a recommendation feature where you could recommend a restaurant to a friend. And if they used your recommendation, you'd both get points and then you could redeem those points for cash once you hit a certain amount. Uh, but it was just such a small amount of money and you wouldn't get those points until your friend used your recommendation. And so it just wasn't enough of an incentive structure for people to actually use that feature. And that was one of the features we ended up scrapping. So um, those, that was one of the lessons that I learned in terms of delayed versus instant gratification. In terms of price, um, so at the very initial stages, a lot of entrepreneurs don't really know how to set pricing. You can look on competitors. We are like, oh, they're a lot bigger than me. So what should I do? Um, so I would kind of, what I'd recommend is pricing around competitors. And then you, at the very initial stages, you can just offer discounts to people. This isn't something that you should need to do at a large, large scale because you want to have some consistent pricing. 
Um, but this is a way that you could try to figure out what the right price is, is by coming in with the price, seeing what the customer's response to it is, and then saying, oh, as an early adopter, I'd be happy to offer you 30% off or tying it to something um, that's like some type of milestone of, oh, we want to launch this big promotion for, you know, Cinco de Mayo. And um, so if you join before Cinco de Mayo, then we'll give you 50% off or something like that and just see um, at what price point different people can sign up. And then the way that you frame pricing is really important as well um, in terms of how, not just the price itself, but also how you display the prices. Um, so I'll show you what our old pricing used to be for restaurants versus our new one and some different things um, that we did along with these bullet points uh, that uh, helps to boost the average price per restaurant. So this was our old pricing where it was called basic gold and platinum. Uh, we just had it displayed on like a simple PowerPoint slide that I would display. Um, and we were thinking, okay, um, the gold and platinum will make people feel really good. Um, and you know, it's a nice incremental thing going from $49.99 to $149. Um, and then we launched this new pricing later and we were able to boost the average amount paid per restaurant by about 40% as we got a lot more to the standard plan, um, to the middle tier. So the reasons that this worked um, is that we dropped the price from of the middle plan from $99 a month to $79. So now it seems more like a deal that the customer was getting by signing up for the middle tier because the gap between the light and the standard plan is smaller than the gap than between standard and premium, whereas before it was equidistance for basic gold and platinum. So people want the medium Coke and so this, and they want to feel like they're getting a deal. So that's what we dropped it to $79. We also added that recommended aspect to it. So we can just make it easy for people to select. And we also changed it from uh, the, what seems like the standard plan here is basic because it's called basic and people are like, cool, I'm good with just the basic gift a meal aspect of it. Whereas here people say, okay, it seems like what the basic plan is, is standard because it's called standard. So making this kind of the baseline helps move people who were just signing up for the basic plan over to standard. And then the last thing was in terms of color. Um, here, the dark, like the color that draws your eye the most is this purple. And then this is like very light and doesn't draw your eye. Whereas here, we try to draw your eye more towards these plans. And then for the premium plan, this is uh, kind of like an anchor price or like a decoy price. And you know, there is value here in these features given to these restaurants. Um, but the 149 a month, is something that is a big jump from 79 a month. So the goal of the premium plan is really just to make the standard plan look less expensive versus if we didn't have the premium plan, then it's just 49 or 79, 79 might seem more expensive, but next to 149, it seems like a really good deal. Um, and then we also just added a bunch of features. So the restaurants that want to make the highest level of impact and want to access the most data and things like that, will choose the premium plan. Um, but at the end of the day, people don't really look through every single bullet point when they're doing these different types of pricing decisions. It's more based off feeling of, oh, I want to do the standard thing that's just going to work, um, or, oh, I just want the least expensive option, or, oh, I want the best because my restaurant's the best, or because I really like giving back, or because I just want this to succeed, or um, whatever the case may be. So, um, yeah, so those are some tips on pricing. In terms of the power and the cost of free, the cost of free, um, when we signed up restaurants at the very early stages and we offered it for free for them, um, it was really difficult to convert them to payment afterwards once we started charging for gift and meal. Um, and so that's something that I would, you know, give as a tip to entrepreneurs is to think through at what point you can start charging customers because it, for us, it was easier to convert, to sign up a fully new restaurant on gift and meal rather than one that was on free and can bring them to payment. Once somebody gets something for free, then they kind of equate the value with the cost. And so they don't really see your program as valuable, even if it was. Um, but the power of free is that, you know, free is a lot more likely for people to sign up for something. Um, you know, like, let's say that um, 49, the restaurant was doing, like, let's say it was like a big chain and they were doing like a million dollars in sales or something for um, annually for that business. Um, then uh, $49 a month is not that much money for them. Uh, but, you know, if it was something where you were offering something for free and had a different business model, then uh, that can be something that is a lot quicker to get approval. So, you know, ups and downs of free.
in terms of place, finding the right place for your advertising and marketing is something really important. When we did Facebook ads and Instagram ads targeted at users, we found that it was not effective at all. And it was like $6 in order to get a download of our app um, versus when we did promotional materials at a restaurant where the customers actually were and they could use the app for the first time. Not only did we get more downloads for it, but it was more likely to get us an active user because somebody who downloaded the app gets that aha moment a lot quicker where they could feel good about using the app versus if you just download the app at home due to a Facebook ad, you know, you might forget about it and never actually use it at a restaurant. So finding the right place is something that's really beneficial. And, you know, these were also way less expensive for us because of the table tents cost us like 11 cents a piece and could last a couple of months at a restaurant. Uh, and so that was definitely a lower cost of user acquisition for us. Uh, lastly, it was just kind of leaving you guys with some entrepreneurial core competencies I've seen um, in entrepreneurs that have been successful. Um, first thing is not physical, but mental stamina. Um, you know, entrepreneur, in entrepreneurship, there's lots of ups and downs. And so making sure that you have awareness of your own mental health um, and whether you're burning out or not and taking care of yourself first is something really important to make sure that you have the mental stamina to, to withstand all of the ups and downs that come with entrepreneurship and make sure that you can be there for your business and make it through adversity. Uh, next is taking smart risks so that you're not just, you know, going scale or fail and um, burning it, it all out um, before you can really test out if your idea has any weight, um, but, uh, and, but also not just plateauing and um, taking it too slow because your time is valuable too. So taking smart risks at a small scale so you can continually go through that cycle of building, iterating, and learning um, to make sure that um, you're really building out your startup in the best way. Uh, next is just being kind, not in a calculating way um, or in a way on reciprocity of saying, no, oh, if you make an introduction to somebody, I'll make an introduction to somebody else. Um, but I found that the entrepreneurs that are just really kind uh, end up doing really well and people want to help them uh, and people want them to succeed. And so I think that's really something important, especially if you're doing a social venture, because then your own personal kindness and personal brand is a reflection on the business as well. Um, and lastly, is just being confident in you and your business and the value you're providing. A lot of entrepreneurs can have imposter syndrome where they don't feel like they're good enough or that, you know, that people think the business is bigger than it is. And so being confident in the, the value that you're providing and in yourself as a leader, um, and that you'll figure it out. Um, even if you don't know all of the answers to that, that doesn't mean that you can't be confident in your ability to figure it out and confident in your ability to ask for help. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs that I've seen that have had their businesses fail uh, just didn't feel comfortable asking for help for people uh, because they felt like they had to know all the answers. So find that balance of confidence in yourself, but also uh, being confident and not knowing all the answers is something that I think is important. So kind of the blend of uh, fake it till you make it, but then also being able to be transparent and vulnerable to people as well. I think we're almost actually out of time. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Andrew, thank you so much for doing this. We loved hearing your story. I even learned some things, even though I've known you for a while, this is really interesting um, and a great um, you know, example of you know, a, a home a St. Louis-based company that is you know, continuing to grow here. Um, and you know, you're doing all the things and sharing your learnings to the next generation. So we really appreciate that. Uh, thanks so much, and thank you all for joining us.